Why is this category aesthetics so transformative and yet so niche at the same time? Boggles the mind, shouldn't be the case. And we think we have the answer. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Technology of Beauty, where I have the opportunity to interview the movers and shakers of the beauty business. And today is no exception. Today you're going to get to know Mr. Eddie Yoon, who's flown in from Chicago. He is legendary, and you're going to get a chance to know him, see his books, and listen to his uh, thoughts about the aesthetics business and the beauty business, and he's been through it all. So Eddie, thank you very much for coming. Appreciate you coming from Chicago to be with us today on the show. Oh, glad to be here, Grant. It's thank so you. wonderful. Since the day I met you, I've wanted you on this <laughs> show. Uh, Aaron says hi. Hello to Aaron. <laughs> you bet. So in an effort to get to know you better, Eddie, tell me, where were you born and where'd you go to school? I was uh, born and raised in Hawaii, actually. Okay. My parents were immigrants from Korea, so I was about a month from being a Korean citizen to a U.S. citizen, so I'll I was right there. on the dark, uh -huh. uh, margin there. Um, I went to the same uh, high school as Barack Obama at Punahou, a great private school out there, and I uh, ended up doing my undergraduate at the University of Chicago. I'd never been to Chicago. I'd been to the mainland once or twice beforehand, and um, I figured they gave me the most financial aid, I should go. That's how I made my decision. So, uh -huh. you know. And what did you major in? I studied in economics and political science, um, not knowing exactly what I wanted to do, other than my immigrant parents wanted me be, to be a professional of some sort. Uh, econ was a logical choice given the university's history with the econ department and all sure. the Nobel, Nobel Prize winners there. But what I found was um, I liked the blend of political science and econ. One of my favorite professors at, at Chicago was uh, uh, Professor John Mearsheimer, who's of some notoriety now because um, he's an international relations specialist. And he had predicted the Russia invasion of Ukraine some five, ten years ago just based on his whole theory of you know, uh, power dynamics and when a rising power um, uh, will take preemptive action against another one. And so um, he, that class that I took from him, War in the Nation State, was my first exposure to making a forecast of some sort. Uh -huh. Loved it, uh, loved the quantitative nature of economics. And so what the, the, my senior thesis that I wrote, I still remember, was the future of the Chinese automobile industry, very, very niche. Um, in particular, my thesis was, you know, uh, you had seen already uh, the Japanese take over the auto industry, the Koreans were coming up, but what needed to be true for China to work was the capital markets had to be there. It wasn't so much about the companies and the engineers, but state-run enterprises don't really work. Uh, you need to foster entrepreneurialism. Capital markets have to work. And, right. you know, I'm some 30 years later, like it's now finally coming true. You have Tesla, you have BYD, and a whole bunch of uh, uh, Chinese automakers that are likely to be the future uh, alongside Tesla. So. so did you get it right? Uh, mostly right. Now, it, it's still, uh, you know, we have to see kind of where the mood swings within, you know, uh, Xi Jinping about how capitalist or communist they want to be. Uh -huh. uh, so we, we've seen the, you know, Jack Ma's of the Alibaba's of the world, like they're billionaires and then they disappear, you know, so you don't really know the state of like, is it good to be a billionaire in China or not? But right. the, the idea that you could become one was very, very much central to the birth of all of these companies. And so, um, uh, I, you, I know you ask about crystal balls. I'll give you one right now is okay. that if um, uh, General Motors and, and, and Ford will, may survive, but many of the U.S. automakers will not survive this. Many of the Japanese ones will not survive it, if you believe that. Uh -huh. um, some of the German ones will be relegated to niche luxury brands, but you're going to see Chinese automobile companies and Tesla, maybe Ford, but that's going to be about it for the future of the car industry. So I, I think... Uh, I didn't get the specific brands right, but um, you know the, the idea that uh, capital markets are key to creating incentives for entrepreneurialism, which is the key to create new change, that's very much true. Okay. So I got that right. Yes, good. So, okay, after the University of Chicago, and you got, it was at your bachelor's degree? That was my bachelor's degree, yeah. Did you, what did you do next? Well, I was uncertain uh, of what to do. Uh, many of my friends were going into academia. I had a buddy of mine he said, hey, let's try this consulting thing. I said, 
what's consulting and thankfully they were interviewing and so um, that was my first foray into professional services. I thought I'd be there a few years and go to graduate school of some sort, which uh-huh. is what my parents wanted. Sure. Um, cause I, I could not explain what consulting was to my immigrant parents. They're like, that's not lawyer, doctor. I'm not sure what you're doing. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I'm doing something right. But, um, I, I ended up staying in. So I, I've been a career consultant. I've never had a real job grant. Um, <laughs> I, I spent the bulk of my career, uh, at the Cambridge Group, which was a growth strategy firm. I was uh, 18 years there, a senior partner there. Um, and uh, we, were, uh, we sold our firm to Nielsen uh, some 10 years ago, and, which was great because I got access to a tremendous amount of data, data. of what people buy and what people watch. And then, so you um, stayed along? I stayed along with, with Nielsen. With Nielsen okay. um, and it w- was a wonderful experience. Met a whole bunch of great folks. Um, because uh, Nielsen had gone private and we took that public and the like. And, but um, what was fascinating to me was a, a couple things. One was um, the first nine of my consulting career was working with humongous companies. So uh, Anheuser-Busch was a big client of mine that had a 48 share of beer in the US. Uh, Gillette was a client, 70 share of worldwide uh, men's shaving. Yeah. The world record I think is, uh, that for me at least, is Incinerator, owned by Emerson Electric, had a 93 share of garbage disposals in the US, yeah. right? So is you can mathematically, it's not easy to get the 94th share point when you have 93%. Right. And so what began was that was the embryo of my kind of career as a writer thinker in the sense of like the traditional ways you grow a business do not work if you have a 93 share. And, uh, and what that led to was the discovery was that, you know what? 99% of what we call strategy is based on military thinking. All comes out of the military. Competitive strategy is really what we talk about strategy. So you know, strategy, it's a lot of definitions for it. Something like how do you allocate scarce resources to a higher return? But it's really what it boils down to is we are here. We want to get there. How do we get there? Uh-huh. Right. And traditionally, if you think about it from a military standpoint, is like, Grant, you're, you're General Grant now, I'm General Eddie, okay. is here and there is very clear. I want you to lose so that I can win. Okay. That is not how the business world works. Mm-hmm. It works in the NFL, it works in the military, but there can be many winners right. in, in business. And that I, what I have found is that, um, you know, and especially if you're Gillette or Anheuser, the only way to grow uh, really profitably is to make the pie bigger, not focus on splitting the pie or you create an entirely different pie. And so that began kind of this whole like, I can't rely on previous thought leadership because it's based on a set of assumptions that don't make sense in a world that's changing rapidly and technology is all over the place. And so uh, my clients eventually shifted to what I call these category creators. So uh, I worked with American Girl, uh, owned by Mattel, just down the street here, right? Uh And you know, this whole kind of, I I have two daughters, I have three kids, um, but you know, had went through the whole, like, explain to me, like, these American Girl dolls are 10x more than a Barbie. I don't understand that. Mm-hmm. And we're going to an American Girl store to, for what reason, to have a tea party with these, like, <laughs> it boggles the mind. But then you realize that it's not a toy company, it's an education company. Mm-hmm. And it's a company that reframes for little girls what it means to be a woman and a successful woman. And you're like, oh, take my credit card and all my money, and that's good, right? Which most businesses struggle to do. I did work with Keurig, and uh, one of the most amazing meetings I sat in was with uh, Michelle Stacy, um, who was the president of Keurig, which was, you know, they, they were off to a great start. Um, they had a number of, of their own brands, and the question was, do we let Starbucks in the fold or not? Uh-huh. You know, big strategy question. Right. Conventional strategy thinking says, no way, Jose, mm-hmm. competitor. Right. Why would you let Howard Schultz fox in the hen house? Um, category creation thinking is like, no, we want the pie to be bigger. For the pie to be bigger, there has to be more abundance and value to the consumer. And so we may lose share, but we're gonna gain a whole lot more users on the platform. And that is exactly what happened. So actually both came true was that they let Starbucks in, they let Dunkin' in, uh, their share went down, but the pie got a whole heck of a lot bigger. And Howard Schultz, six months later, launched their competitive single serve coffee machine uh-huh. called Verismo. And this is instructive for a couple of reasons. One is that um, being a category creator, you have to be comfortable with atypical thinking and that this idea that we should collaborate versus compete is very, very foreign to most people. Right. And so um, he, uh, 
he launches his single serve coffee machine, uh, fails. Because uh, do you have a Verismo? No. Nobody does, right? No. And so uh, it, it, it goes to show that no matter how powerful, like, it's not like Schultz is an, an amazing executive and that Starbucks isn't an amazing company, but copying and competing, not so effective of a strategy as it is c- to create and to grow uh-huh. the enterprise. So I, I did a whole bunch of work with that. Um, and that led me to realize that, boy, you know, um, the stuff that we teach aspiring executives and business school students, uh, increasingly doctors who want to learn the business side, a lot of it is wrong. And hmm. I can only have so much of an impact, you know, a few clients at a time. By the time I was a senior partner, I had three junior partners working under me, I had nine clients, and it was just frustrating because I liked doing the work. I grew up doing the work, and it was too far removed, and I was just kind of overseeing it. It was unhappy, so I, I left. Um, Actually, related to one of the books I'll, I'll talk about is uh, my, my middle daughter, Audrey, who, when she was in sixth grade, uh, got a call from uh, her email from her English teacher. It was like, hey, I had a school assignment. Daughter, uh, uh, the kids were to write a children's book. You really ought to read what Audrey wrote. I'm like, all right. So I opened the book. The book is about uh, a yellow balloon that comes to life and relentlessly pursues her workaholic father uh, <laughs> before he loses his family. And so that... This is the book here, actually. It's called Joy that she wrote. We actually had it published because um, the moment that I read it, I, I had two questions. Like, is this about me? <laughs> and why, why is this story in the universe? What, what am I supposed to do what with it? You're supposed to learn from it. Well, yes. I'm supposed to learn from it. And, and what I, uh, it, she actually wrote it very cinematically. You read like a movie script. So I was like, you know what? I knew a, a guy who ran a, a children's book publishing company. I sent the manuscript to him. And two questions. Is this about you? And then, you go, oh, maybe it's about me. And I was like, oh, you know what? This story needs to be out in the world, uh, even though it'll probably raise some questions with me. And then there's a whole issue of how do you, you know, immigrant kid um, in a professional services environment, you end up being a workaholic. And there's consequences and there are benefits to that, right? But uh, the book really kind of led that, um, made that clear. And that was around the same time I was working on my my book that you probably know me from right. Super Consumers, published mm-hmm. by um, Harvard Business Review. And um, those... Can you give that yeah, yeah, yeah. for a second? I just want everyone to see, this is an unbelievable book called The Super Consumers. I recommend every one of you read this book. Thank you. Yes. Well, in, in both books, what I realized were um, it allowed me to scale the impact that I had in the world. Okay. Um, it in allowed a way you that, to scale the impact that you had in the world. Yes. Okay. Yes. And that the, the reason why I stick, you know, I was like, why, why am I still in my career here? And then I love helping companies grow. It, it was such a joy to do that. And, and in a way where it was uh, atypical and unconventional and it was like, oh, this whole idea of scarcity out the window. You know, you don't have to lose for me to win. We can both win. We just have to think differently about it. And um, what I realized was that Consulting, like most professional services, like many academic fields, um, has a strange set of incentives, right? For me to be successful, you have to perceive me to be smart. Okay. And to, to be smart, I must have some knowledge. And usually, uh, to demonstrate my knowledge, I need to create new words that most people don't understand. Well, it's called jargon, right? Okay. And the more jargon I have, smarter I appear to be, and therefore the more, the more, pay you. The more exactly, right? Right. And so the problem was that behind all the jargon uh, was like a very simple set of ideas. Like, why did you just say that earlier, right? You know, this, this whole idea of super consumers is that there's a small set of people who passionately care about the category, whatever it is, mm-hmm. and, and spend a disproportionate amount. And it's true in every category that this is where uh, my time at Nielsen came into play. I, I, I had this idea for my consulting career, but I had access to hundreds of categories in hundreds of countries. And it was like, the pattern's always the same. You know, the top 10% drive 30 to 70% of category sales. Uh, now that's in physical products, in digital products, it's even more extreme. So um, I'll, I'll give you a great example. Uh, the number of video gamers in the world has more than tripled in the last eight years from 50 million to 100 and, you know, uh, over 150 million. And they're not teenage boys in dark basements playing $100 consoles, you know, playing violent military games. 
it's a lot of middle-aged women, many of the clients that come into aesthetics, playing casual games like Candy Crush or Words with Friends that have different business models and different pricing mechanisms. And what you realize is that um, this whole idea of uh, super consumers, because most of these casual games are free. Mm -hmm. The only way they make money is if you get so addicted that you like, I just have to spend money to unlock these other things. And so what ends up happening is 0.5% of the consumers in casual gaming drive 50% of the revenue there. I'll be darned. A half a percent. Half a percent. Are they addicted to it? They, they are. Is it like they, gambling? It, well, it's, it's um, certainly there are addictive properties of what it is. What, what I've found is that um, the reason why people are super in their categories is uh, it's not just that they derive enjoyment to the point of addiction. It is they are the MacGyvers of the category. They've figured out that this casual game entertains me, but it provides a use case that no one's ever thought about beforehand, that I derive tremendous value from the rest of my life. And that what you'll see is that, um, uh, you know, it, it's like, you know, I, I only imagine as a surgeon, you go in, you're looking for something, oh, you, oh, I see these other things that are there, right? Is that what I always always say is a, a super consumer of one category, this is the most important idea in my book, okay. is a super consumer of nine other categories some of which are obvious and some of which are non-obvious. Okay. And all the great strategies are in the non-obvious thinking, right? So the, the example that I write about is um, uh, I did work for Generac, which is a standby generator company. You know, okay. Hard to sell. It's, it's um, uh, seven to $15,000. Uh, you have to talk about the power going out related to, often to a bad weather event, bad stuff. Mm -hmm. And I want you to spend a lot of money on something that you may never use. Right. Not easy. Like to for see. here, it's earthquakes. Exactly. We all that. have them. You all have them. And, you know, selling earthquake insurance is probably really hard to do, right? And so this, this whole thing was like customer acquisition really hard, right? It may sound familiar to the aesthetics industry. Like, how do I find the needle in the haystack? And what we found was that people who, uh, there's a lot of people who bought a generator after a bad power event. Mm -hmm. And yet there were a small set of people who were buying them exogenous of a bad event happening. The weather was fine. Power was fine. And they proactively sought this out. So we said, what's up with that? Like that, that's the, you know, why is this seemingly aberrant behavior happening? And I, I, I love, you know, this whole kind of uh, weird data I was talking about, that's the best stuff. Uh -huh. It's all the nooks and crannies, the peaks and valleys. Like, why is this? you know, a statistical anomaly exists. And we figured out those people, we matched it with credit card data, right? So um, okay. say, okay, you bought a generator. Let me match credit cards of people like you. you look at the credit card statements. In, in aggregate, we're not actually looking at your credit card statements. Yeah. Right? But it turns out um, uh, you went down the rabbit hole and they were super consumers of life insurance. They were way overinsured when they needed to. Uh, they tended to have three to four refrigerators and freezers at home. And they love vitamins. And so you look at these categories, seemingly nothing to do with each other, and you're like, what do they all have in common? Protection. Mm -hmm. Proactive protection mm -hmm. that I may never, ever use or need. I may never, I don't need to know that I actually got a benefit from it because the primary benefit I get is I feel peace of mind right peace now. Peace of mind, yep. And that you, you follow a peace of mind super consumer is an amazing person to sell a generator to. And that if you are Generac, and this is, this is what they actually built out, was a whole predictive model that allowed them to say, if you do this in some faraway category, you're going to be a great prospect for me. And so there, there's a whole bunch of trends going on. You talk about your pod is the technology of beauty, right? Yes. What's happening in technology is uh, there's a set of things that are true, is that when technology makes a massive leap, productivity goes up, costs come down. Right? So yes. um, uh, we have a place in Hawaii, we have solar panels there. The, my favorite app in the world is the Tesla app. When I open it up and like, there's free electricity from you know, heaven coming down and it's, one, it's a wonderful feeling. So energy costs are going to zero, which is gonna be an amazing thing for the world, right? And that, um, you know, think of all the wars that we fight over scarce you know, uh, energy and the like, like this is gonna be an amazing outcome and, and abundance for the consumer. Uh, computing costs are coming down, right? You can go uh, AWS or everything, like all, that's going to zero. 
I think marketing costs are going to zero as well. And how's that? Is that when people figure out that, hey, the, your best customers grant are sitting in my data set, and I may not be in at all your same category. Okay, and like for, the generator. Like the generator. Yeah. So you, you take, you take um, uh, a savvy doctor, a plastic surgeon in the aesthetics business will understand that, you know what, the, 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 if you're listening to this, the first thing you should do now is find your local orthodontist. Because somebody, in, and you say to them, let's partner up. Tell me the adults who are coming to get braces, discretionary right. braces. You know, uh, maybe insurance covers it, maybe it doesn't, cash pay. Those are the same people who are likely to be the same aesthetic super consumer, right? Because mm -hmm. I actually, I was listening to uh, your Brent, conversation. With Brent Hauser. With Brent Hauser, yeah, but, no, but actually with, uh, with Josh Macau. Josh, uh-huh. Remember? Yeah. Because I, what I, what I and, and I always, again, the, the weird data is what I, the, uh, what I love. Very successful person. I, I honed in on the failure that you asked him about, right? It's mm -hmm. like the, the weight loss thing, I, you know, it was an issue up here, not down there. Right. You know, I, I, my, my favorite quote is pie may take four hours, but pie is going in the hole, right? <laughs> One way or the other, right? <laughs> and um, the thing that I think I find amazing, um, because I, I know Josh from other work that I've done, is that you look at how wise and smart he is. And it's just a matter of timing. Now, he, if, if you rewind the clock, or let's, let's time travel, he takes that product in this day and age, he can solve that problem. Mm -hmm. You know, why? It's because we can take marketing costs to zero because the way that you find somebody who, you know, gets that, 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 that lap band procedure and keeps the weight off, is you look for that same behavior in another category, which is to say, um, I want evidence that you can pass the marshmallow test somewhere else. Because mm -hmm. that shows me, that, that you'll shows be a good me candidate. that you'll be a great candidate for that. And that data is actually very easy to find. You just have to find the right partners. And you're going to end up trading customers and trading data in a way, uh, like you see what Elon Musk is doing with Twitter now, like, um, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. but. The reality is the advertising category is bad. All, most of it is bad. It's like, you know, it's not human communication. It's I have a megaphone and I'm shouting at you when you, at the, the wrong people at the wrong time with the wrong message. Like, how do I know that you want this GM car or this or that? I don't. So I just shout it louder mm -hmm. and I hope for the best. So you spray and pray. It, but the reality is if um, I can deduce uh, through empathy and analytics that, boy, you know, um, I see Grant, um, you're exhibiting this behavior, costly behavior, monetarily, willpower, energy, emotional, whatever it is, right? But the fact that you have done this tells me that you'd be a, an amazing candidate for that. And let me, um, I won't tell it to you. I'm going to tell somebody else who is like you Okay. And have them tell you right. what's going on there. Because word of mouth is the most powerful uh, form of marketing that you can have there, right? So like, um, and, it, and it, this, one, this one I think is, you, know, you tell me, um, I think a lot of doctors are feeling like, oh, you know, I, if I had the time, I would learn more about business, right? This is an opportunity to learn what people who are great at business don't know how to do now. Okay. Which is, so traditional business teachings and tr traditional business models are not the future for yes, aesthetics yes. or for doctors in yes. general. I, I, would, I would tell folks is that um, uh, do, doctors should not waste their time and money getting an MBA. Okay, I was just going to ask that. A lot of guys and gals are going back and getting their MBAs. Yeah. And I know a number of MD MBAs, and uh, frankly, I don't think they're doing all that great. And that may be why. So why don't we take what you're just talking about and apply that to the aesthetics business, if you will. Absolutely. Uh, the beauty business. Yeah. I know initially I met you along with Clint Carnell and mm -hmm. Hydrofacial with Aaron. And uh, I'd ask, like to ask you, when did you first get involved in the beauty business or the aesthetics business? Was it when you were with Nelson? Uh, was it more recent? Yeah. How, how did you get involved in that part yeah, of the world? Great question. So um, I, I'm often the least informed person wherever I am working in the like. But I, that's what's refreshing, that's though. What, it's, that's it's my magic. That's, that's just, right. Yeah. That is the secret sauce. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you didn't know anything about generators nope. either. Nope. So tell yeah. me uh, the beauty business, how you got involved. 
So mo mostly um, uh, Colgate was a longtime client of mine. Okay. Um, I did a lot of work and um, uh, actually you'll find this funny. Is, uh, some in skin care there, some in oral care there, um, but uh, formative learning for me was in pet care. Oh, you may be like, well, what does pet care have to do with you know, aesthetics? Yeah, like, well, yeah. I'll explain, right? Is that um, uh, if you look at the super consumers of pet care and you overlay the same super consumers of infant formula, they are identical. Oh my goodness. Identical, right? Uh, people who will do whatever the vet says or whatever the peed says. Science rules the roost. To moms who are like, no, nope, breastfeeding is best. And pet owners who are like, natural is best. And I, science is evil. Two different people. Uh -huh. and, but if you know who one is, you can predict their behavior with amazing accuracy. And I, 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 I've been waiting, I've been telling companies forever, like, you know, there's a lot of pet food companies that should just buy Enfamil from <laughs> Me Johnson or whatever. Like, the data um, uh, that you can get from when you have a baby, uh, and, and it might be the reverse is true, but it's like, you see these, when you have the diversity of experiences that I do, you see the patterns everywhere. And that what I realized was that um, the consumer set in oral care, identical to the consumer set in aesthetics. But people haven't connected the dots with it, right? Um, and that the so oral care even like toothpaste, toothbrushes, yes. uh, whiteners, not even orthodontics. Yeah, right. So because it's not orthodontics. It, 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 orthodontics is an amazingly strong signal. But what you find is that there are oral care super consumers, which which Colgate vehemently denied the existence of. Like that doesn't exist. People brush for twice. Everybody brushes twice a day. There's no variance in the data. I'm like, not everybody brushes their teeth. Come on. And some people brush. A lot. And of those people who brush a lot, many of them spend an amazing amount of dollars on Sonic Cares. Sent, they buy Sensodyne. They don't buy the regular toothpaste. They buy floss. And, and in fact, um, the oral care super consumer drives probably 60% of the revenue. And they, they buy, on average, eight different oral care products. Right? So you tell me, um, if you had a list of com uh, consumers that were so fastidious and disciplined about that, um, would that be useful or not useful information for a surgeon trying to make a decision about what kind of treatment would you be regimented for or not, right? So oral care was fantastic. Um, I also did work on the, um, uh, the vet side and the dentist side, fascinating, is that the same motivations, um, the different types of super consumers on the uh, proctor, uh, provider, practice or HCP side, identical to surgeons and derms, in the sense that, um, I had some veterinarians who were like, do you see my house in the south of France? Uh, you know, uh, pet food, prescription pet food bought that for me, uh -huh. right? And they love prescription pet food. It was like, you know what? It was great lead gen for my practice. People would come in for you know, Royal Canin or Science Diet or whatever it was in that um, uh, it allowed me to win their trust for surgical, uh, medical, pharma pharmaceutical type stuff. It was the secret weapon for them versus other people like, you know what? Nutrition is a waste of my time. You know, I, I'd rather be doing surgical. Like, and the difference was amazing in terms of the productivity of the practice, but also the long-term success. Like, it's so much easier to sell a vet practice that has a huge nutrition and prescription pet food business than one that's predicated on Dr. Dr. Grant cutting and, sewing. cutting and sewing and the like. And so you can see um, those folks who were really savvy business people, for sure, um, who had uh, not just kind of uh, healthcare goals and patient care goals, but also aspirations to, you know, how do I create something new and different, right? And the, the macro theme that I actually found was that, um, this is a fun one, this is, this is why I left Cambridge, was that um, one of the emerging trends that you see in business and professional services and in, in healthcare is that people are waking up to the fact that being a professional is great, being a pirate is better, <laughs> exponentially better. And I, Grant, you are a pirate. I am. You are, you are not like the others, right? Um, and those of you who know me know that I always say uh, that it's always best to be a pirate. <laughs> yeah. That's why uh, my, my co-authors, co uh, Christopher Lockett and Nicholas Cole, we founded, uh, we, we call ourselves the first ever, we think, Business writing band. We write books together. Okay. Not one Instead of so. making music, 
You're a business writer, yes. man. So show us yes. some of your books. So uh, Category Design Toolkit, uh, this is the whole discipline of category design and creation, what we talked about of like don't compete, create and collaborate. Like this is all of our writing here. Uh, and uh, the second one that I want to highlight is the Snow Leopard. This is a book about um, how to be a one of one as a writer, a digital writer. And I'll tell you why I think doctors in particular, this is the secret to unlocking all your professional aspirations, which is the, this is about how you write with clarity, not be clear, not clever, number one, okay. but the, the category of digital writing. Not As opposed to traditional, traditional creative writing. Traditional creative writing in that. Can I see yes, that? Yes, the, the, Are you gonna leave this for me I, to read? These are all gifts and actu oh, actually. Um, thank you so much. I'll, I'll, I'll explain uh, because you know, you're Grant Stevens, like anyone listening who wants a free trial, the category Pirates or Substack, I'd be just let them, have them reach out to you and I'll grant them a free trial. Oh, that's very generous of you. Yeah. Well, because I can't yeah. wait to read this category Pirates. And, and this is my, this is my, my fundamental premise. Uh, crystal ball, another yes. one, right? Is, yeah. is that um, the most successful doctors, plastic surgeons, derms, whatever it is, right? are going to be the ones who master digital writing. Not Instagram and YouTube, not, I mean, th th yes, some of that, but the people who can formulate, it's, we call it languaging, which is a verb that we made up, right? Okay. It, it's how do you language magic words that convey an amazing punch with pith? Right? And so um, I, you, you tell me, this is my assertion, uh, unencumbered by facts, is that there are two words that are probably the most valuable in all of plastic surgery. Okay. Mommy makeover. I wonder who came up with that. You're looking at him. <laughs> so, which is why you're a pirate, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, why, in, in, you know, I, I don't have to explain to you, right? But it's, you trade up, you bundle, all the things, but in two words, you captured the aspiration of the aesthetic super consumer. And no explanation necessary. I want that, do whatever you wanna do, here's my credit card, right? Mm -hmm. um, the key is, what are the next couple of words? What's the next, what is the mommy makeover 2.0, right? Mm -hmm. And it is not, you know, how well you do surger, surgery, your outcomes, these are table stakes. We expect that to be the case, right? right. And which is mostly true for you know, every doctor out there. <laughs> but the ability to, you know, to recognize that the more expert you are at something, the correlation is very, very strong that you are, your language is complex and you do not speak clearly. It's just the way that it always works. You know, you, you, you are so in love with the thing that you're good at that you have all this unique jargon and lexicon. The, you lose your ability to speak with clarity like mommy makeover. This is all about how you become the one of one to create the next one because I guarantee you um, more powerful than the number of Instagram followers you have is your ability, ability to frame, name, and claim a niche within aesthetics is everything to success, which is to say you don't want, you know, a Tommy Tuck. You don't want a face. You want a mommy makeover. Right? And that's languaging at its very, very core. And that what, 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 what I feel very, wh why we wrote the book, right, is that um, I actually think, uh, this is your other question about MDs going to get MBAs, is that higher education has let us all down. Let's be very, very honest about it. Like medical school, fantastic. You know, everything you learn, you have to apply. Like it, it's, it's very much clear. You go to medical school to become a doctor. You know, you have residency. In between. It, the, the line to a career and a vocation, it's crystal clear, mm -hmm. right? Uh, law school, to, you know, to, yes, to some degree, but not, not as, in my opinion, clean as medical school. Uh, business school, no. It is, you're there uh, for the stamp, you're there to make a job transition, to network. There's the primary value in most business school is not what you learn, and not the skills that you develop while you're there which is the reason why, um, I, so I, you know, I, I never, my parents begged me to go to graduate school. I was like, I'm having fun in my career. I don't need to go. And, you know, and I, I'm thankfully now in hindsight, you know, it, it was very, very good for me um, to not go because it just helped me accelerate my career. However, um, what you're finding is that um, 
uh, college enrollment is down uh, a million and a half students in the last 10 years. Okay. Um, the, the value prop, like what you pay now to go to college is not necessarily going to give you a payback depending on what you study. Mm -hmm. And so uh, consumers, students have to be very, very careful about where they choose to spend their time and their money on what education actually matters and which ones don't. And that the reason why um, this book is so important is that, uh, you know, I, I think there's no reason why you, you pick your favorite you know, higher education school. College tuition should not be the same. It should vary by major. And English majors should be, should be a fraction of the price of a regular college degree because they're worthless. Mm -hmm. They don't teach you how to write. They teach you how to read. They teach you how to read other people's stuff. Right. They should be, you and know. it's hard to monetize. And it's hard to monetize that, right? Now, now here, here's the reality is that, um, actually, there's a, there's a the, the next book I will send you, we're work, working on, it's called Intellectual Capitalist. And this is all based on um, a, a framework that I've really fallen in love with. I, I, you, the test it with you, tell me if you agree with this or not. Okay. Is that, um, uh, th and this is, it's so up your alley, the technology of beauty, right? Um, uh, we, talk, we, we open the book with a parable, right? Hunter, gatherer, dad, you know, takes um, daughter, says, let's go hunt and gather. Daughter says, I, I have a different idea. I, I think we should farm. I think farming might be better than hunting and gathering. Like, you know, yeah, you know, the rewards aren't immediate, but it'll be better in the long run. Hunter, gather, gatherer, dad says, daughter, you don't know what you're talking about. You're young and you're naive. We've been hunter-gatherers for generations, right? And so you have this kind of divide between what I think is happening now is um, a native analog human, which is you and I, mm -hmm. over the age of 35, versus a native digital human, a new kind of human, somebody below the age of 35. And the reason how you, uh, how you distinguish them is um, their primary life experience is digital versus analog in the real mm -hmm. world, right? It's the difference of you see a beautiful sunset on Manhattan Beach, would you rather look at it or would you rather take a selfie of it? Mm -hmm. That's the divide there, right? Right. And that what you're finding is that um, the American dream is an analog one. We go from laborer to knowledge worker to creator in analog, meaning you, you do it in a physical way at a physical place for a physical company, right? Um, and, you know, the, what I would tell you is, and it's no, no different, you, 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 money isn't everything, but you can use it as data, right? Is that, you know, um, a resident makes less money than a surgeon who makes less money than a pirate doctor out there who's creating everything that they want to do, right? However, um, the only way you get to escape the matrix, which is to say a laborer sells their body and, and, and time, time for money. Mm -hmm. Knowledge worker sells their mind and time for money. Right. You're still selling time, which is the most precious resource you have. You get the creator, you, you no longer have to sell time, right? Because mm -hmm. you've written books, ideas. you've ideas, your YouTube channel. Like, and that is, it's not how much money you have, it's how much agency you have over your life. It defines your wealth, mm -hmm. right? Because if you have, and this is like from, from my high school, I have 10 friends who become doctors, right? And during COVID, um, my family, we were fortunate. We, we went to a place in Hawaii. We hung out there, and it was actually very nice to be there yeah. during COVID. And I, I was having a conversation with a buddy of mine who, um, he's a cardiothoracic surgeon. We were just kind of chatting about, um, you know, actually, a biomed, which is a J&J &J just acquired, right? We were just talking about it. He was asking some things. He was like, explain to me what's going on. Are you still working? I'm like, mm-hmm. He's like, he's like, he was just asking me how I'm doing my, well, it doesn't really matter where I am. Um, I've gotten to the point where I've, I've focused what I do to the highest value parts of it. And I don't do the rest of it because it's, it's irrelevant, right? Like most consulting things, um, here, here's another um, reason why not to go to business school is that uh, the best professional services firms like the McKinsey's and Boston Consulting Groups, mm -hmm. secret, they're teaching hospitals. Right? Yes. You think you're getting Grant Stevens? You're getting first year med student. Mm -hmm. You want to pay the premium for that? You can. You know, and you trust that Grant is overlooking the work and make sure that's good. But you're training newbies. You know, great, great bait and sweat. No one really talks about that, right? And so, 
Uh, what you're finding is that within professional services firms are um, people who become professionals, the most senior partners are exiting to become pirates, right? So I left. I didn't, you know, I was not good at managing people, so I left to do my own thing on my own time because I didn't want to run a firm. I wanted to do my work with clients. I wanted to write, right? Uh, Byron Trott uh, is Warren Buffett's investment banker. Okay. Left Goldman Sachs. Did not need Goldman Sachs. Guess who Warren Buffett stayed with? Byron Trott, uh -huh. right? Um, I know folks who are leaving the top tier banks, law firms, the most senior partners who are like, why am I here for the title? Does that really matter? Like I want to escape knowledge work to creator mm -hmm. because that's when I get time and agency work. Now here's the problem is that it's not easy to go up that, right? And that what most um, doctors that I've talked to, be it you know, vets, orthos, dentists, surgeons, uh, derms, it requires them to admit that I'm still a knowledge worker. I'm a very highly paid knowledge worker. Or in the case of surgeons, I oftentimes say I'm just a high pay, highly paid uh, carpenter. Yes, yes. yes. <clears throat> I don't actually totally believe that, incidentally. No, but it, 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 and it's <laughs> but it is. For sure. For it, sure. There's some truth to it. There's I'm some a truth laborer. To it. I'm a right. carpenter. And the way that, again, money isn't everything, but it's a data point, right? Is that, I mean, you'll, you'll tell me, is that you know, doctors, surgeons, specialists are at the pinnacle of knowledge workers, you know, make seven, maybe eight figures in some cases, right? Uh, nine, how many billionaire knowledge workers do you know, right? You have to be a creator to get there. And it's not, and again, whether it's the money or the ability to dictate your time and your place, you know, you have to get to that creator phase. Now, here's, here's what's interesting. Those, that, that ladder up is now a two by three because there's an analog and a digital version, right? Because okay. here's what's fascinating is that there are analog laborers. I, I work, I'm a resident, I'm doing this thing. And there are digital laborers, which are, um, do, do you know, there's a guy by the name of, uh, I think I'm getting it right, Dr. Ali Abdaal? No. He's a British doctor, went to Cambridge, uh, practiced for one or two years in the UK general service, makes $4 million a year as a YouTuber now. Right? As a what? As a YouTuber. Okay. Right? And so he is, what do you call this guy? He's, he, he's a creator. A, he's a creator, but he's a digital creator, right? right. And, you know, the analog creators of the world in the medical, it's like, no, 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 you got to practice. You got to put in your time. You got to earn your chops, get all the, you know, speaking events and publications. And then you, maybe if you are worthy of creating something amazing, you can be a creator. This guy did none of that and jumped to becoming a digital creator immediately. He can do his work from wherever he wants. And, that, that, and so this is the part that's really, really interesting to me is that, the American dream used to be uh, an analog one, you just one way up, right? Laborer to knowledge worker to creator. You add a digital layer to all of this, right? You can be a digital laborer, meaning, you know, you get the, you're still laboring, you're still trading your, your body for, and time for money, but do it from wherever you want to do it, right? You can be a digital knowledge worker, not a, just an analog one. And it's the same kind of thing. You, you get paid for your expertise and your, you're still trading time, but again, maybe you're not confined to a place. You can dictate the terms of your life in that, you know, like part of the challenge with, um, uh, I, I think one of the uh, weird causality or correlations with uh, the medical with plastic surgeons is that you have to be located in an area that people can afford your services, mm -hmm. which means that your income, though high that it is, probably gets chipped away because of your expense structure that you have to run the <laughs> practice and live your life in, right? Now imagine you can be a digital knowledge worker, earn what you want to earn, and live where you want to live. And, you know, I mean, that, that changes the math entirely, right? Mm -hmm. And this whole idea that I have to put in 20, 30 years, then I earn the right to become it's all out the window now. And that part of, um, I'll, I'll explain um, the, the, the math of the business, or the, the publishing book industry, um, we, we did the data where we, we bought um, from Bookstand, which was owned by Nielsen, the top 444 books in business, right? And we, we, we kind of deconstructed, you know, what works, what didn't work, right? And what was really, really interesting was um, in that process, not only did we understand what works, which is that the top two categories of books within business, can you guess? 
No. No. Yeah. You would think it'd be strategy. You'd think it'd be, you yeah, know, something kind of right. highfalutin management. Uh, personal development, personal finance. It's about the oh, reader, it's about the person. not the author. I'll be darned. And so what you find is that um, there's a funny pattern. Like, so you see this, uh, so this book, big title, category pirates on at the bottom. You know, I, I give this to friends like, where's your name? It's not on there, right? Because there's a correlation. The bigger the name, the worse the book does. Is that right? If you put your picture on the cover of your book, the worse it does. Because people buy books for them, not about you. Now, there, there are some circumstances where it's a memoir, yeah, celebrity. They learn yeah, about yeah, 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 all that kind of stuff. But like, you know, Billie Eilish, amazing pop singer, wrote a book, bombed. People thought she's famous. People would buy her book. It was about her. Nobody really cared, right? I mean, so th this whole um, concept of how do you um, not only write something that is compelling, that's why the whole writing, I think, is m perhaps the most underleveraged skill that a physician can undertake. You can practice now, like nothing's holding you back from doing it. You have the intellect, you have the discipline. If you, got, if you had the will and the skill to become a doctor, you have the will and the skill to become a great digital writer. But it takes time and it's a whole different type of humbling education that you have to go through. And why that's important is that, um, you know, my first book was published by uh, Harvard Business Review. Uh, my co-pirate, Christopher Lockhead, he wrote a book called Play Bigger, Oliver Sequoia in, in Capital, in, being in the VCs of Silicon Valley world, Harper Collins. Neither of us went back to the big publisher houses. Right? Mm -hmm. Why? Because uh, to be an author means that you have to sell 90% of the ownership rights of your ideas to the publishing houses. I didn't know that. 10% royalties, right? Every book that you have. Uh -huh. So why is Taylor Swift re-recording all her songs? Uh, because... When she was up and coming, you know, um, somebody else recorded the song. They own a piece of that studio master. Somebody else distributes. They own a piece of it. The creator gets very, very little coming out of it, right? And so um, there's a whole, it's, it's kind of hilarious. There's a whole drama about like, you know, some private equity firm wanted to buy her songs. Like, you know, like the Beatles uh -huh. albums are worth millions, if not billions, right? And so she said, screw you guys. I'm just going to re-record all my, it's my music. I'm going to re-record it. I'm going to own it. And so... What you're finding is that um, uh, we write on Substack now, which is a you know, subscription service. You know, uh, great journalists have gone on there, and it's, it, you go direct to the consumer. Okay. We write, we charge 20 bucks a month, 200 bucks a year. Substack takes 10%, great. And both of these books we wrote um, on Substack first and published on Amazon second. We, we own these entirely. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we will re-record them as audiobooks, monetize it again that way, right? Like the whole book industry is completely backwards and upside down, and negative against the creator. And so, you know, um, you know, I don't know how many doctors you run into are like, oh, I'd like to write a book. And is that a thing or? Yes, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, most but it's usually about their experience or educational, yeah. you know, yeah. in surgery, it's how to do surgery and the various ways in which they approach a problem yeah. to optimize the appearance. So what if I told all of those doctors that there's a way to do that without squirreling away 18 months in the cabin writing? You can still practice and do that, right? Um, but rather blog your way to a book. But don't, you know, but do it in a way where somebody pays you to write the book and you retain 100% rights of all your content. It's yours, you're the creator, you should own it. And that in doing that, process, you may come up with the next mommy makeover that actually lights your practice on fire. Because it is the magic words that matter to unlock because it is, there's no problem with your surgical skills. It is, you haven't framed, named, and claimed the problem yet. The magic words are critical to doing that. I would agree. What's your advice to plastic surgeons then and aesthetic surgeons, aesthetic yeah. and cosmetic terms? I, I would say, um, uh, number one, reject the premise. Everything you've been taught, probably no longer true anymore. Or okay. increasing, and it, it's not that you learn the wrong thing, it's that technology is changing the game. Uh, what a time to be alive is the real sentiment behind it. Like there's so many new things that have emerged that were not present so 20 years ago, 30 years, when you started out. So, you know, 
good on you for doing what you've done, but recognize that the game is different now. It's a great time to be alive. Um, and, you know, if you want to stay practicing, that's fantastic. But if you want to be a creator, never been a better time to be a creator, right? And, and it's, let me put it differently. You want to be a pirate? Never been a great, better time to be a pirate. Because you, you look at, again, I'll, I'll look in business, right? Um, have you seen, there's a chart um, called the PayPal Mafia. You seen this one? I have not. It's a big constellation of all the entrepreneurs and investors and executives that came out of PayPal. Okay. Right? Elon Musk being one of them, right? And so the YouTube guys, uh, Chad Hurley and Stephen Chen, um, uh, Sequoia Capital, uh, uh, David Sachs, you know, there, there's uh, uh, Peter Thiel. Like there's a whole bunch, uh, all from this one thing, right? Um, what I will tell plastic surgeons is that um, there is an aesthetics mafia being formed. Mm -hmm. Would you like to be part? But if you do, that's like, you, know, you would be in there, Clint would be, you know who I'm talking about, yep. right? Um, these are people who are missionaries. They're not just great doctors. Yes, they're not just great CEOs. They are pirates. They see a future, the present angers them, and they will not stop until the future looks like what they want it to look like. And there's gonna be a chart that says, within aesthetics, there are 20 or so guys and gals that you know, hated the way the world was and pushed like heck to get it to the, what it should be. And they changed everything about how uh, plastic surgery was practiced. They changed how um, you monetize your practice. They changed productivity. They changed everything to the point where, um, you know, it's not about being a seven, eight figure plastic surgeon. It's, let's talk about being a nine, 10 figure plastic surgeon. Let's talk about billionaire plastic surgeons. Again, money isn't everything, but it's about people who can no longer be controlled by their practice and no longer controlled by their patients necessarily, right? Because importantly, patients are gonna increasingly have more and more power. You have to do this route, right? And so this, there's, a, there's a world where you're gonna have, um, you know, this aesthetics mafia, it's gonna be full of pirates. Uh, and you know what? The water's gonna go out before you see who is John Scully versus Steve Jobs. John Scully was the ex-Pepsi guy brought in to bring, run Apple yep. after they, you know, Apple board smartly, not smartly, fired Steve Jobs. And turns out being a professional, good in some circumstances, but doesn't make you a pirate doesn't make you part of this aesthetics mafia. And Steve came back and rescued and Steve it. came back and rescued it. And you see this happen over and over. The pirate again. won again. Pirates always win. Okay, well, we could go on and have chapter after chapter and course after course. This could go on forever. And I have learned a ton. And first thing I'm going to read is right there, Snow Leopard. Um, yes, the aesthetics mafia. I want to dive into that a little bit. And that's both, it, you mentioned CEOs and surgeons. So it's, it's industry as well as mm -hmm. the providers, and it's the, especially the non-surgical space. And I know that financing mm -hmm. the procedures, that's a big deal. Subscription models, a big deal. Metrics and KPIs that, you know, it used to be that profit, well, still, in a lot of medical conferences, profit is a four-letter word. I gave a talk on that years ago. Um, you ask about the future. Uh, you mentioned about mommy makeover. How about daddy do-overs? Yes. I mean, the male, the emerging male mm -hmm. population that we're targeting through Marina Manland and other male-directed mm -hmm. services, the, um, the, the daddy do-over, the gummy bear breast implant, mm -hmm. the laser bra. There's a number of things that were not well-received initially because, unfortunately, they were seen as being lowbrow. Yes. And medicine's highbrow. And uh, profit was a four-letter word. Well, now it turns out, as you mentioned, all we have is time, right? So the creators are leveraging their brains, and it's not a time issue. Yes. So I couldn't agree with you more. There are going to be many who watch this who will not agree with you. Uh, and th that's never, I'm not shy of that. Yeah. And I know you're not, I can tell. So this is all very interesting, and uh, I've learned so much from you. What are you doing right now in the aesthetics world in particular? I, I've heard that you're working with Aubrey and or Clint, yep. dear friends of both of ours. Mm -hmm. What's going on in your life in the aesthetics business? So I'm, I'm still doing uh, Eddie Wood Grow, my consulting business, still doing Category Pirates. You know, my, my primary goal is to educate and teach in, through writing. But, you know, life's funny. So uh, Clint, uh, Aubrey Rankin, uh, Gary Berman and I, we've created something called Grayspace, which is you know, uh, 
most people want strategy to be black and white, but it's usually you know shades of gray within that. It's a different kind of professional services firm, um, full of pirates, not professionals, as I mentioned, right? <laughs> um, in that you have people of different disciplines. You know, I, you know, I'm a growth strategy guy and a consumer guy. You know, Clint is a one of one. He's Clint, and Aubrey, you know, started Hint MD and sold it, and obviously. You know, as a technology person, and you know, Gary is an amazing finance and ops uh, executive, and um, we are here to serve the ecosystem. You know, I, I was going to say, there's um, people think of innovation as I launch a new product. Uh, it's moved from that to I launch a new company to nope, launch a new category, but really where it's at now is um, let's launch the ecosystem, right? Because I, I think collectively we're on a mission that is like. Why is this category aesthetics so transformative and yet so niche at the same time? Boggles the mind, shouldn't be the case. And we think we have the answer within the collective disciplines that we have in a way that we hope one plus one equals 11. Um, we're, gray space is not designed to scale gray space. That's not the goal, it's not about money, it's about impact and unleashing the next set of entrepreneurs because there's a lot of, um, you know, we talked about MBAs, there's a lot of CEOs. You know, there's a lot of them out there. Um, most of them are manager stewards. They weren't there when it was created, and they weren't there when it was scaled in the hockey stick part of the S curve. Mm -hmm. Clint's one of those. It's a rare individual to do you know, to find. And so, what we are trying to help are uh, companies that have not yet hit the hockey stick. Hit that. Figure out whether it's um, you know our, our motto is we simplify strategy and accelerate execution, but. A lot of it is, you know, the classic cold things of strategy that we do, but it's the languaging, right? Which Clint is a master at, you know, you're a master at, and I've done a lot of it, but like, you know, so much of what, um, you know, Clint has done, you know, back at Hydrofacial and everything else, it's great operator, great CEO, great with investors, but he's a master languager, right? Yes. Three steps, 30 Once minutes. you get it, you, get, you get, it. get it. You get it. And Three steps, best skin of your life. What, what people are finding is that because it's not taught, you know, again, angry at the English professionals out there, like you need to do a better job, right? <laughs> it is not taught well, is that what happens when great CEOs and entrepreneurs like Clint are great languagers, that everything else feels a little off, you know? It's the difference between um, the Rolling Stones and a cover band. Sounds the same, doesn't feel the same, mm -hmm. right? And that, um, you know, again, Clint, like me, um, he can have value being a CEO, You'll have more of an impact teaching other CEOs to be a pirate. A pirate. So that's what Gray Spaces really is. Okay. So are you working with Clint with this uh, this new company that yes. he's running? Yes. Uh, so I'm helping him out in the team with a Janeo part mm -hmm. of Luminous. A, a similar kind of evolution of you know when Clint became a free agent. You know, hey, do you want to run Janeo? No, you know, I got claims on my time and Embrace CEO and Orange Swiss with, you know, Grant and everything else. Um, what will you advise? Okay, so that's, Gray Space was born that way. Let's do a different type of advisory work um, to, how do we go from advisory to help? And so we're still looking for the right words to describe what we're doing, but um, we've taken over leadership of the U.S. portion of Janeo, um, uh, still uh, in conjunction with the Luminous executives and the private equity owners that have them. But, um, you know, we've structured the arrangement where uh, we are working in conjunction with, but we have piratey freedoms to do piratey things mm -hmm. because that's th that they know that's where the value is going to be unlocked. And it's not doing it the way that it was, but seeing how it could be. And so, um, you know, we need new language for what exactly we're doing. So, in, in, which is also to say, I'm not exactly sure what we're doing either, <laughs> but we are curious people. Um, the mission is very clear. You know, how do we get this gateway to aesthetics become bigger and broader for more people? But also, um, the mission that we have, you know, 100,000 estheticians in the US, how do we make them not five figure professionals, but six? seven, eight-figure professionals, because it's absolutely doable. And what the, the digital American dream that I laid out, right, it's not just for physicians to go from seven, eight-figure to eight to nine, ten-figure folks, is um, imagine the impact we'll have on society when your classic esthetician, you know, maybe a single mom, you know, maybe not having a college education, becomes YouTube famous in a creator um, and can have agency in her life, 
give treatments when she wants to give them. You know, we've actually been calling them um, extrapreneurs, right? So they're not just estheticians, but yes. like they're entrepreneurs in their own right. But that that the clarity of the mission that we have is, um, you know, we know that if Gineo scales alongside hydrofacial and everybody else, like it's in this, uh, it'll be good for the aesthetics category. And, and it's actually, we're collectively creating a new ecosystem within aesthetics. And you might go, what is that? And I will borrow language from what Clint is doing at Embrace, um, which is, you don't have to look worse before you look better. Mm -hmm. Wow starts now. And the category, the subset that we're talking about is, um, you know, this whole idea of a portion of aesthetics where the wow starts immediately. Wow starts now. And that, you know, being like, oh, Botox, it's so, you know, successful. What, why is it? Is it because of the brand? Is it because of the No, it's because it starts now. <laughs> you know, same thing with a hydrofacial and a Janeo. Same thing with an embrace, right? It goes behind the teeth. Your smile improves immediately. You don't have any aligners or braces on the outside. This whole immediate gratification without compromising outcomes mm -hmm. is the new future of aesthetics. And the more that, um, you know, fellow pirate creator doctors understand, oh, how do we make the wow start now in every category that we do? Growth will happen. Um, how do we um, find wow start now consumers? I, again, you know, uh, I, prediction, uh, you're going to see a lot of co-located plastic surgeons with orthodontists because it's the same consumer. Absolutely. We talked about that when Brent was on. Brent Hauser was on and we talked about Embrace. And I've been talking to a number of people in that business with my job with Engage Technologies about putting teeth, well, aesthetic dentistry, not just yeah. straightening, but whitening and the whole oh. mouth aesthetics, combining it with plastic surgery, aesthetic plastic surgery, facial plastic surgery, because it's the same consumer. There's absolutely no question it's the same consumer. Which is why marketing yeah. goes to zero. And right? Okay. And the other thing about this, we're talking about Janeo and Hydrofacial, I'd love to hear your thoughts about home-based care because it is my feeling also mm -hmm. that if you could give someone a home-based uh, Hydrofacial, we'll say, or Janeo or Silk Peel, Diamond Peel, uh, something where they take it home and they can cleanse, extract, exfoliate, uh, and then infuse, mm -hmm. that that is a home run. Undeniably, um, macro trend in all of business was historically businesses ran, hey, consumer, you come to me, mm -hmm. it's going to be, nope, we go to you. So home-based businesses make the complete And I think that'll bring them back in and the estheticians will sell it and then that'll, but that'll drive business back into their office. Some Absolutely. will be afraid that somehow they're giving them the keys to the city, but I feel very strongly that will generate more business. Pie gets bigger. Yeah, absolutely. Gets, and, and you know, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, my, I, one, my, my eldest is in college now and my um, middle daughter, I'm helping her with her entrepreneurial class. I have real questions in my head about, you know, we've talked about the value of higher education. They missed their mark and I worry about what you study and is college actually a good idea or not a good idea? I'm not sure. Um, but would I be better off dropping a quarter of a million dollars for my kid's education or buying them, you know, a half dozen Janeo machines? It's a real question. If you have any fidelity to the math, you would say they would make far more money right out the gate than any college degree from any prestigious school that you could get. If we measured the quality of life with just with dollar bills, then you might be right. Yes. But the relationships and the experiences of a college education to me, are the number one value. It's not the return on the investment. So that, I, this is where yeah. I disagree on yeah. charging less for the English major, because I think the value of higher education, that secondary education, and even there beyond, you know, it's the uh, experiences, the contacts, mm -hmm. the relationships you develop over the whole course of your life. This might be something I come back and we, we really discuss this in thor thoroughly, because I, I agree with you for us. What happens when you send your kid and your kid is on Instagram the whole time there? Right? Yeah. This is the, to me, it's like, you know, uh, iTunes was successful unbundling songs from the album. All I'm saying is unbundle the college experience so people mm -hmm. can cherry pick what they want. Because you're exactly right. If I could, you know, pay specifically for that networking, character formation, making mistakes, community, that's worth a quarter of a million dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Not the education necessarily. Okay. And so it's, but it, it's all, all from like, Again, what a time to be alive. Like, you never oh, know what might happen. It's the most so. exciting time. So, Eddie, you've been talking about your Substack. How can we go and uh, subscribe to it? What yep. can the consumers do? 
Yeah. Well, you can uh, go to Category Pirate Substack or just, just search those three words and you can sign up there. Uh, I will uh, also, if you, uh, you know, ping me on Twitter, at Eddie Would Grow, or email me, eddie at eddiewoodgrow.net. Um, tell, just tell me, I'm a friend of Grant's. I'm a listener <laughs> of Grant's and I'll give you a free comp subscription. And uh, you'll tell us if you like it or not, if you want to subscribe. But um, to me, uh, we are all about helping people escape from the matrix. So if that's you, we want to help. Um, it has been absolutely wonderful to have you on the program and to listen to you. Will you come back? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. I'm going to read them all. And I have some ideas. Um, I must share with you a couple of things. Please. I sold my practice. I sold it to myself. In a sense, uh, a Phoenix now owns Marina Plastic mm -hmm. Surgery and Marina Med Spa, and I'm on the board of directors of a Phoenix, and I'm part owner of a Phoenix and so forth through Latticework Capital, which frees me up and frees my time up. And I want to do just what you're talking about, and just like why I do this, the opportunity to meet people and learn from you and people like you and to network. And as you know, there are people right outside this room who, uh, who you network with yeah. and who- I'll give you two words, Grant, to describe that? what you just did. Personal IPO. You took yourself public. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, leveraged myself. You're, you're right, I did. That's interesting. Well, thank you, sir. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Safe travels thank back. You. Are you going back to Chicago? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's a little colder there than it here. Is, yeah. uh, it's been an absolute delight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Grant. And I want to thank all of you for joining us in this episode of The Technology of Beauty, where we interview the movers and the shakers and the forward thinkers of the beauty business. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next week.